last Sunday we dealt with the resurrection as we celebrated Easter. And even though we didn't necessarily go into the details of, um, of the resurrection of Jesus, we went into the resurrection of Lazarus, and um, specifically with Martha. Um, but, but today, uh, I just want to continue on in dealings, uh, ministering with the resurrection. When, and from, from the moment of the book of Acts all the way through Revelations in the New, New Testament, when the gospel was ministered and when the gospel was preached, there was always put the emphasis on even on the resurrection of Jesus. And so it's a part, obviously, we know of the gospel message, but even more so than what we realized. Um, and, and so we can see through Scripture that there were the disciples that were in disarray, um, even though Jesus had risen like he said he would three days um, after he was crucified. We, we know that he resurrected, the resurrection power manifested, and the disciples had a hard time believing it. Uh, those that were walking on the road to Emmaus, they were distraught. Their countenance was down. They were pretty upset over what was going on, not even realizing Jesus comes alongside and begin to open up the scriptures as they walked on the road to Emmaus. We see the disciples in different aspects and in different ways having encounters uh, with Jesus along the way. Over 500 people uh, were eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. He encountered over 500 people in 13 places um, after his resurrection. <laughs> I think that's amazing. Um, <laughs> um, I, I guess I like those little details. I don't know. I think, they're, I think it's a, a pretty beautiful thing. You know, for a lot of people that would try to dis disprove or say, you know, uh, even in that day they were saying that the disciples uh, actually took his body and hid it, which is so outlandish and so crazy. It was kind of that political spirit that loves to um, try to manipulate through lies and opinions and um, you know, you can see that these disciples did not um, change their life forever because they had hidden the body of Jesus. For Peter, who had denied Jesus three times in one night, even with a, a young girl, we could see that it wasn't only but, but not long after that in the book of Acts chapter 2 that he stood up on the, uh, from the upper room and he declared the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and thousands were saved. He doesn't do that because they're trying to hide the body and trying to try to cause a commotion and try to cause an uproar so they don't know what's going on. When Peter goes throughout his life, his ups and his downs, and he wasn't perfect, but um, one thing was he was passionate. And we could see um, through the works of Josephus that when it came for his time to go, he said, you know, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Savior. But he requested, and they fulfilled his request, that he was crucified upside down. Okay, the, these things do not happen by men that are hiding and, and living in a lie. No, it's quite the opposite, actually. They came face to face and were eyewitnesses with the truth, the way, and the life. And have forever changed the, the way that they lived. They no longer feared death or what would come uh, once because they had seen what Jesus had done. They were a part of seeing. i got to make sure I don't knock anything over up here. Uh, but they, they, had, they had seen... They'd see what Jesus had done, and, they, and when they saw what he had accomplished, it, it took a fear out. Now, I mean, you know, they talk about in today's society, like, um, like the number one fear is like the fear of public speaking. Nobody wants to get up and talk in front of people, and nobody wants to die either. But they actually put the fear of sp public speaking above the fear of, of the, the people would rather die than speak in front of people. But, but um you know, it, it, it's something that even believers, like we love Jesus. We can't wait to get to heaven, but it doesn't seem like too many believers really want to do the death thing, you know. It's, it's one of those things that it's just not a, a comfortable experience. And, but because of their encounter with Jesus, they were forever changed. You never see Jesus denying them again. Never again. Did he deny Jesus? And yeah, again, he wasn't perfect and he made his mistakes, but he did not deny Jesus like he did before. And he went to out of this life and into eternity, um, not because of a lie, but because he had encountered a truth.
And so we can see throughout all these disciples, but what I think is uh, pretty uh, incredible is Saul of Tarsus meets him on the road to Damascus. Now, he was not one of those close disciples of Jesus. Matter of fact, we know he didn't like Jesus. He didn't like the followers of Jesus, and he was going to be passionate enough to prove it. But on that road to Damascus, he encounters Jesus and that we've dealt with before in such a beautiful way. And from that moment on the road to Damascus, he had come to know the resurrected Jesus. Now, you have some disciples that did not really understand what was going on, and they were not able to receive of, of the, the promises fulfilled that Jesus had done. And even though Jesus had rose from the grave, even though he had taken the keys of death, hell, and the grave, even though he had them in his hand, some of the disciples were still, they, they, were, they were walking around depressed. How can that be? That Jesus had accomplished what he said. But the, from the foundations of the world, this was something that was placed upon the plans and uh, upon the, the plans of heaven. And, and it is accomplished and fulfilled, and Christians were walking around depressed. Isn't that something? Isn't that something how still to this day, if we are battling depression, battling darkness, battling fear in some way, it's because we're under an influence of a lie in some way, shape, or form. Somewhere there's a lie that we are believing, a lie of hopelessness, a lie of nothing ever being able to turn around, of, of believing for too long and not seeing it, that hope deferred. But we're here to talk this morning that there was a king that rose from the grave, and, and the grave could not hold him. Him. There was no grave. And I love it because they, they put him, I love as, as Rod says, they put him in a borrowed tomb because he didn't plan on staying there for too long at that tomb. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, they even set garrisons of soldiers around uh, to keep the disciples for, for doing something um, that was going to be deceitful. And yet when the earthquake happens and when they arrive, there's an angel sitting on top of the stone that was rolled away. I, that is just, God is so cool. I mean, that is just, don't you just love it, you know? And, and, and one of the best things, if Pastor Sandy was standing right here with the microphone right now, she would be talking and letting you know of the revelation that when Jesus rose again from the dead, that he took those garments and he folded them nice and neatly and put them on the edge right there. and says that he, he was neat. He loved it. Everything in its place. And yes. <laughs> You know, but, but in this resurrection, even though it had happened or it had been accomplished, we see some of the disciples not being able to receive it and definitely not being able to walk in it and live in it. And what we have to do is make sure that in our life that we're not like other disciples on the road to Emmaus that are depressed, walking down, trodden, and not realizing Jesus is walking right beside us and us never able to take a look and have to receive from the resurrection power that he has already accomplished for our life. But, but Saul, we see, and, and I love it. I'll get to scripture. Don't worry. It's a, we'll, we'll go to Ephesians chapter 3. It says this in verse 10, that I may know him. Wow. That I, this, this is what he's writing. Is it possible that right now he's writing behind this jail cell, uh, bars of a, of a dungeon that he's placed in? That I may know him. Listen to this. And the power, everybody say power. The power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might obtain unto the resurrection of the dead, and that is though I have already attained, and either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Oh, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth into those things which are before, and I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling and God in Christ Jesus. Hmm. He didn't come to make bad people good. He didn't come to make good people better. But he came to call the dead to life. This was 
the reason why he came. This is the reason why he gave his life away. And this is the reason why he rose again. So our goal is not just to be a good person. Our goal is not just to continue to get better. But our goal is to help him receive the reward of his suffering. Is that I would allow the enemy to keep me in a place that I could not truly live. And there's something about when I live. But Paul also would tell his son and the Lord, you know, follow after me as I follow after Christ. And from that moment on the, this is in Acts 9, but on that moment on the Damascus Road when he met the resurrected Jesus, from that moment on, he began to have that, what he's pinned in Philippians chapter 3, we just read in verse 10. From the moment of meeting him, it, it, it placed this encounter that he forever had this drawing and this calling in his heart that I may know you, oh God, to know him. To know him. Now, now, Paul was an amazing scholar, and he's, he knew the law. He knew the word of God, and he had a face-to-face -face encounter. He also knew Jesus growing up. You know, they grew up at the same time. Uh, you, you, you don't become one that's studying the law, and we know Jesus was even teaching and even read from Scripture in the synagogues. You don't do that. They didn't just let anybody do that. Like, Saul of Tarsus and Jesus knew each other. So he knew him before and he knew him after. And it changed his name from Saul to Paul. How many of you have had an encounter from Jesus that changed your name? That means what people used to name you by, you no longer go by anymore because you've encountered the one who changed everything for your life. It's as if you could be called by a new name, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. He got a name out of this encounter. No longer Saul of Tarsus, but Paul, and going to be called Apostle Paul that is known around as he's most famously known for. Apostle Paul. And this is the one that knew the scriptures that would still cry out. The one that met Jesus face to face. And it says, Lord, that I may know you. How could he say that? How could this be his prayer? Paul, these letters you're writing, they're going to be put into the canon of scripture. I would say you got a pretty good clue on who he is, wouldn't you? How many of you think that your Facebook quotes or vlogs are going to ever be put into a scripture somewhere in the future? He, he had his letters placed into places of scripture that the Holy Spirit was flowing through. The power of his resurrection. Now, let, let, when, when you're talking about this, he gives us the step-by-step -step detail. So if you find yourself entombed behind depression, hopelessness, or despair, how is it that you're supposed to be able to come into this place of resurrection? I love it. We sang it in the song. If you walked out of your tomb, I'm walking too. How do you do it? One step at a time. One step at a time. You place one foot in front of another. And you take a step of hope despite of what you feel. You take a step of hope in spite of the circumstances in your life. In spite of the devil's lies. I'm taking another step of faith, another step of hope, and another step of life. This is how you do it. And Paul is giving us these descriptions. And he's telling us. <laughs> his testimony that we've read before is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? These are people that were debating Paul's messages, critiquing him. I speak as a fool. Am I more in labors, more in abundant? Let's look at his testimony. And stripes above measure. And prisons more frequent. And deaths often. Uh, the Jews five times received 40 stripes, save one. That's one more stripe was a death sentence. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwrecked, a night and a day I've been in the deep. Journeys often, and perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen. <laughs> That's one thing if you have all the other testimonies. He says, these are my own countrymen. 
and perils by the heathen and perils in the city and perils in the wilderness and perils in the sea and perils among false brethren and weariness and painfulness and watchings often and hunger and in thirst and in fastings often and cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the cares of all the churches. And I don't want to get in, I don't even want to get into that last verse. But Paul is giving us a window to some of the things he's been a part of in his journey. Now, we all want a face-to-face encounter with Jesus. And I don't know what you think would happen when we have a face-to-face encounter. I think the limits are off. I think it's limitless what could happen. But what I can tell you will happen is if you have a face-to-face encounter with Jesus, you can still go through some things in your life. And this is what Paul is speaking about. All the things that he went through and how can he still be preaching the gospel? With everything that he's been through, how can he still have faith in his lungs? With all these things that he's been through, he says it, what we read in Philippians chapter 3, he says this one thing. Take note of the one thing because what he's saying has some clout behind it. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. How can he say this? Well, we know that in his own ministry that there was a resurrection of the dead when he prayed. We know in his own ministry that they just took the sweat from his handkerchiefs and demons fled by his sweat. Talk about power. Get some anointed sweat up in here. He knew the power of resurrection, and yet his heart cries out that I may know you and the power of your resurrection. And you cannot keep out the fellowship of his sufferings. And I kind of think I balled it all up into one that you could see what we read. That if he's in a place of resurrection or if he's in a place of being stoned and left for dead. And many of the theologians believe he did die but was just resurrected. He does speak about encounters about a friend that he knew that was caught up. To say that he knew the power of his resurrection, I would have to say yes, he did. And yet the heart of the man was still crying out that I may know you and the power of your resurrection. And if I'm in a revival in a city or if I'm left for dead, that I know you in the resurrection time and that I know you in the times of suffering. Because he went through it all and he allowed none of it to detour him from this one thing that I do, he says. He was able to step into a life of resurrection one step at a time. And as the worship team comes, I don't know about you, but but I think I could sing that song all day long. Because there ain't no grave, right? If someone could please get the worship team for me, please. (laughs) Thank you, Sally. I appreciate you being the worship team member that's getting everybody out from. Matter of fact, I'd like to know who's all out in the foyer right now that uh, does not want to come in. A A lot of people out there. Praise the Lord. Because in the power of his resurrection, there ain't no grave. There ain't no grave that could hold Paul down. They tried to murder a martyr, John, but they couldn't do it. There was a love that when we don't understand One of the most quoted scriptures is that he turns the bad things around for our good. But the full scripture says, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
And in order for the bad things in our life to be turned around, we have to keep our love on. We have to keep our love focused and our direction of love pointed due north. And we have to be about the purposes of heaven. And that's what allows the bad things. And Paul says in many scriptures about how he glories in the suffering of what he goes through, the sufferings for Jesus. Now, in that song that we also sang, because we, we, we spoke, <laughs> see, Isaiah prophesied it so beautifully because we are all caught in the depth and the, in the shackles of our sin. See, iniquities and transgressions are two different things. The iniquities are those desires that we have on the inside that we think nobody knows. And maybe they don't, but it's okay. Somebody does know. Because that's the unfortunate thing. People like to, to speak about grace and that we live in a day of grace, which is true. But, but I don't want you to mistake him because Jesus preached a sermon about grace. And it wasn't a sloppy grace. He said, you heard it said. I wish, I, wish, I wish he would have just used a message version or a nicer version translation when he preached his sermon. But he said, you've heard it said. And he starts going into what they thought, you know, um, it, if, I, if I murder my brother, how it's a sin. But I say, under the law of grace and then under a new and a better covenant, that if you look upon somebody with hatred, it's like you've murdered them. Wait a minute. He said, you speak about committing adultery and that being a sin? I say, if you look upon a woman and you desire it, you've committed it already. Now, if I was to give an altar call right now, <laughs> this is grace that what he lives in. See, Jesus would walk into that house and he would answer what they were saying within themselves. That's iniquity. That's why David would say, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto you, O God. Because he hears it all. Oh, Lord, forgive me. You hear it all. And a transgression comes from the word trespass. That means you've crossed the line. You've gone from a desire and you've placed it into action. And you cross the line and now it's sin. But Isaiah said, he was bruised. Come on, gateway. He was bruised for my. He was bruised for my iniquities. This is what Isaiah prophesied. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And the beautiful thing is he doesn't bring up our sins. And when he stretched out his life upon the sacrifice of that cross, it was for you and for me. And when he rose again, it was for you and for me. And now the future of the resurrected king stands in Revelations chapter 1. And he says, verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. I love it. He amens himself. Come on. He's like, I am alive. I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. He's telling John, go tell the church, I got the keys. I got the keys. I've got the keys. And he's speaking about in the future that we see from Thessalonians chapter 4, throughout the New Testament and the book of Revelations, how there will be a trumpet sound. And we're excited that he rose again, but he is coming again. I said he is coming again. There will be a trumpet sound. Everybody's standing. And Paul said this one thing I do. 
Lord, I thank you for depositing with inside of our hearts a cry that does not lose its voice, that we may know you and the power of your resurrection and in the fellowship of your sufferings, that in every state of our life that we may know you, that the power draws closer to you, that the suffering draws closer to you. And that like all those that saw you in your resurrection form, that we take part in knowing you, the one who is alive forevermore. To know doesn't mean by head knowledge. It's by experience. That I may know him, or better translation might be said, that I, may, that I am found in him. Because he didn't look after Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus came looking for him and delivered him and broke the chains. And there was no grave of religion, no grave of being wrong that was going to hold Paul down. There was no jail cell that was going to hold him down. He would sing out praises even if it was the midnight hour. And I'm here to tell you this morning, there is no grave to hold you and me down. No grave. Does anybody have a song and a sound in their heart? Would you join with me this morning in lifting up a praise to the one who rose again for you and for me. And the truest form of the gospel is that we don't put this revelation or this place of Jesus on the back burner, but it's at the forefront of the gospel. And everywhere that he preached was the resurrection of Jesus. And even though Easter's over, we still celebrate that once we were dead, but now we are alive. Once the devil tried to come and take our life away after we have surrendered our heart, but we stand saying, there ain't no grave. Come on, Gateway. There ain't no grave that can hold our praise back this morning. Come on, give them praise. Come on, give them praise. Yes. Yeah.